Some of you who have braved uh, the snow, uh, although the roads seem, I think, are clear. Uh, so thank you for coming, and it's an important day. Um, one thing we're going to start with is um, something we missed last Sunday, which was the uh, showing uh, the uh, video of, of the bishop candidates. So we're going to show that now so that you all get to see it. Um, it was sent out as a link on on email for those of you who have email, so maybe some of you have seen it already. But so we're gonna um, we're gonna show this now, and then um, then we'll have uh, the, the the praise and worship. Thanks very much. <clears throat> Sunday school way back when. I was at the College of Career and Engineering outside the church. I'm involved in uh, Sermons. I'm in the Student Association with that. I've also been involved with some chaplaincy uh, responsibilities and also worship in the city where we organize a uh, worship service for our community. I'm uh, currently on the youth committee. I've been there for I think since 2008, so I'm uh, the old guy on the team. Uh, I've been the assistant bishop for the last 10 years, and then we also been on the Bishop Advisory Committee and also the Examination Committee, which uh, has been, uh, which been a lot of fun. I enjoy the discipleship. I enjoy seeing young men and women who want to serve. They're already indicating that by getting baptized, membership, those kind of things, and if them seeing their strengths and being able to equip them and enable them. Open some doors of opportunity and my role as a pastor at church I get to proceed to opening those doors, which is fantastic, and then just watching them thrive in those opportunities, which is, uh, which is great. So that, uh, that's My name is Davey Martins. So I've been at Christian Faith Church for approximately nine years. Um, my wife, Annie, and uh, we have five children. Uh, with New Tribes Canada, but we were supported by uh, the CMC during that time. 
and then it came back and I've been uh, the executive secretary for the conference since uh, 2014. And so with that, I've been involved in the commission board and radio board and different publications. And I would say I like uh, teaching and preaching in particular, but I like uh, being able to look people in the eye and see that they're catching on and, and uh, responding to it with faith, responding to God with faith. I think I had a lot of big questions at different periods of time, and I was glad that those people were around would help me with those, and so I, I want to be a person that can help with some of those uh, big questions that people have as well, and be able to point them uh, back to Jesus, so that's exciting for me. So just to uh, um, reiterate, uh, the, so these are the candidates. We'll be uh, distributing the ballots next week. If you're not able to be here next week, you can call someone, call one of the ministerial and, uh, and ask them to do a, a, a vote for you and put it in the ballot box. And, uh, uh, and, 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 but we'll do it next week. Please pray for these men and uh, uh, pray that, uh, that uh, God will lead them. Each of them are in a role right now. So some of them, uh, like they will... Some have more, however you want to call it, uh, collateral damage, if you want to say it that way. There's more things to arrange if they become bishop uh, because they have a lot of things that they now have to give up. And so uh, there's, this is a big deal. And so please pray for these men. Thank you. Good morning. I hope you're all ready to sing some hymns. <clears throat> and we're going to start with song 112 in your hymnal, Blessed Redeemer, 112. And please stand with me. Turn 
turn to page 228, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. 228. <clears throat> Number 351, near the cross. 351. Yeah. 
Good morning. It's nice to see so many of you here today. I expected a little bit of a smaller crowd. It's good to be here. Friday is a little bit of an unusual day to be in church for a worship service. But this isn't just any old Friday. It's Good Friday. And many have asked the question, what makes Friday good? This is the day when we think about Jesus' death, his crucifixion. What makes it good? It's a good question. I'm not sure where that name came about, why it's called Good Friday. I know um, somebody had pointed out to me this last week that, uh, I think it might have been Bill uh, Siemens, that uh, in, in German it's Dark Friday. Some places call it Black Friday. Um, the idea of there's a, there's a darkness that kind of hovers over it. So it's a good question, why do we call it good? This may seem a little, sound a little bit strange to some of you. Um, I encourage you to resist the urge to kind of in your mind skip ahead to Sunday to think about the resurrection. Today we sit in the death of Jesus. In hindsight, we know that the resurrection is coming, but just for today, we think of the darkness of what took place on the first Good Friday. We contemplate the disciples who betrayed Jesus, who denied Jesus, the disciples who ran away and hid in fear. We contemplate our own sin that made it necessary for Jesus to be on the cross, and we mourn that. We mourn our own sin. Because the joy of the resurrection on Sunday holds a greater significance when we can actually sit and acknowledge the despair of the death on Friday. So acknowledge it. I think Friday is good in that light. It's not joyous Friday. It's not happy Friday. It's not celebrate Friday. It's just, it's good Friday. There's a good result from the death of Jesus. Today we'll be reading the words of Mark chapter 15, verse 1 to 15. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to turn there. I think this is a passage that encaps encapsulates the meaning of Good Friday. Throughout the history of the church, theologians have described the cross in the terms of the blessed exchange, where Jesus gives his life for the life of mankind. And I think the story of Mark 15, verse 1 to 5, really illustrates this. So let's pray, and then we'll begin. Heavenly Father, today is a special day, not because of celebration, but because of realization. We confess that we have strayed from, you, from who you have called us to be. We have sinned. We have disobeyed you. We have traded the truth for a lie. We have rejected you, and we have sought to be the rulers of our own world. And because of this, we should be lost beyond hope. But it is because of your love for us that you have not left us hopeless. Today we contemplate the significance of the death that you died. As we read what the scriptures have to say, Father, we pray for your wisdom and insight and for your presence to guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. It must have been a long and uncomfortable night for Jesus, but also for his disciples who waited to see what the religious leaders might end up doing to him. Though Jesus' ministry had caused tension, he had never been arrested before. This was new ground. This was a, a new space. That evening, just hours earlier, they had perhaps unknowingly eaten what was the last supper with him before his death. Throughout the meal, Jesus spoke plainly of his upcoming death and about his resurrection, but the disciples didn't seem to understand. After they had eaten and Judas had slipped away, Jesus led his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And it was while they were in the garden that Judas accompanied by a crowd of thugs with swords and clubs, returned to betray Jesus into the hands of the chief priests. They arrested him. 
And they brought him before the high priest and the chief priest. It was essentially a, a panel of Israel's religious leaders who were there to gang up on him, firing questions at him, attempting to formulate a charge against him with which to bring to Pilate, the Roman governor. They found one. Jesus claimed to be the Christ. Blasphemy to Jews. Somewhat irrelevant to the Romans. The Jewish religious leaders faced a bit of a problem. They wanted Jesus killed, but they needed Rome to do it. In John's account of Jesus' trial, he writes in chapter 18, verse 31, So Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and judge him according to your law. But the Jews said to him, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. So they dragged him before the Roman court. And this is where, before the Roman court, this is where Mark begins his story in chapter 15. Let me read verse 1 to 5. Early in the morning, the chief priests with the elders, scribes, and the entire council immediately held a consultation. And they bound Jesus and led him away and turned him over to Pilate. Pilate questioned him, So you are the king of the Jews? And he answered him, It is as you say. And the chief priest started accusing him of many things. But Pilate questioned him, saying, Do you offer nothing in answer? See how many charges they are bringing against you? But Jesus said nothing further in answer. So Pilate was amazed. I imagine that Pilate was actually somewhat annoyed by these religious leaders. They seemed to be making a mountain out of a molehill. Rome didn't care about Jesus. He hadn't done anything to them. If they did care about him, if Jesus was actually a threat to them, they would have arrested him first. They wouldn't have consulted the Jews. But as it is, Jesus represents no threat to them. Pilate questions Jesus not because he really cares, but because the Jewish leaders have thrust Jesus into this Roman trial, giving false testimony about him. And Pilate asks a very simple question. So are you the king of the Jews? Essentially, he's saying, are you who they say you are? And Jesus responds, it is as you say. Yes, he says. This answer caused an uproar, not from Pilate, but from the Jews. Verse 3, And the chief priests started accusing him of many things. Like a shark out for blood, the Jews verbally attacked Jesus, giving false testimony that didn't even line up with one another. Or as Mark writes in 14, verse 56, false accusations that were not consistent. There was holes in their stories. Logic, reasoning, clear thinking, that all ran out the door in their mad drive to crucify Jesus. Even the priests could not get their story straight about him. And Jesus remained silent. Noticing this peculiar, peculiar response, Pilate, in verse 4, asks him, Do you offer nothing in answer See how many charges they're bringing against you? And Jesus says nothing. Not a peep came from Jesus' lips. Just silence. It's natural when we are accused of something to, that is untrue to fire back. To give a response that will set people straight. When we have a chance to clear our own name, we take it, making sure to drag others down with us. They're not getting away scot-free, but not for Jesus, just silence. If anyone could have set them straight, if anyone could have defended himself, Jesus could have. He even has a listening ear from Pilate, but he doesn't defend himself. Why? 
because he knows that what is taking place must happen for the salvation of the world. And his love for us didn't allow him to jeopardize that. It wasn't about him. Jesus' silence is a deafeningly loud proclamation that his life is placed in the Father's hands. And as he prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, your will be done, not mine. Jesus' silence is a message that he actually is who he said he is, the suffering servant, the Messiah, the Lamb, who as Isaiah prophesies in chapter 53, verse 7, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to slaughter and like a sheep that is silent before his shearers. In this moment, Jesus entrusted his life to the will of the Father and he resisted the temptation to defend himself, knowing that his death would make salvation possible for even these people that are accusing him. Picking up in verse 6 to 11. Now at the Passover feast, he, being Pilate, used to release for them any one prisoner whom they requested. And the one named Barabbas had been imprisoned with the rebels who had committed murder in the revolt. And the crowd went up and began asking Pilate to do as he had been accustomed to do for them. Pilate answered them, saying, Do you want me to re release for you the king of the Jews? For he was aware that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. But the chief priests stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Jewish revolts happened on a regular basis in the Roman province of Judea. Jews had never taken well to the idea that Rome actually held power over them. They were God's chosen people. Their God was stronger. Therefore, they should be the ones in power. And their understanding of a Messiah was that a Messiah would come in the form of David. They imagined a Messiah that would be a mighty warrior king who would lead the nation of Israel in the revolt of all revolts that would once and for all destroy the Roman oppression, turning the tables on them so that the Jews would be the ones who would reign and, the, and that the Romans would be the ones who would be subject to them. Most Jews felt powerless, and so they waited for the Messiah. But there were others who took it into their own hands and tried to beat back Rome by themselves on their own terms. Pilate was busy putting out the fires of revolt in every corner of the province, which is why, again, Jesus hadn't really become a threat to him. The Roman prisons were filled to the brim with rebels who had attempted an insurrection at one point, but who had also been captured. According to Mark, it was customary for Pilate to release one prisoner during the Passover holiday. I find this interesting. Why would he do that? I assume that it was a political move. It was a bucket of water thrown on the fires of, of upheaval. It kept the people happy, at least for a little while. But Pilate, knowing that Jesus is actually innocent, suggests to release him instead of Barabbas, a dangerous prisoner who had committed murder. Verse 11. But the chief priest stirred up the crowd to ask him to release Barabbas for them instead. Who is Barabbas? Barabbas was a known terrorist. He was a political zealot, intent on doing as much damage to Rome as was physically possible. But the name Barabbas is significant to us for different reasons. It is unlikely that Barabbas is actually even his real name. Rather, I believe that for Mark, it is a play on words that is designed to teach us or to explain to us some of the weight of what is actually occurring in the story. In the Hebrew, the word bar means son of. For instance, I am Robert bar Earl. Jesus Christ was Jesus bar Joseph. Also in the Hebrew, Abba means father. Bar Abba 
Barabbas together means son of the father. The Bible historians also suggest to us that Barabbas' real name was Jesus. Jesus was a common name at that time. And so the name Jesus, Barabbas, is saying Jesus, son of the father. Where have you heard that before? Mark 1, verse 1. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the son of God, the son of the father. Mark 14, verse 61. Just before this trial, the Pharisees asked Jesus, Are you the Christ, the son of the blessed one? In other words, the son of the father. And he replies, I am. Here we have two men. The real Messiah, Jesus Christ, the real Son of God, and pitted against him on the other side is a counterfeit Messiah. Jesus Barabbas, the Son of the Father, a false Son of God. And the people now need to choose who will die and who will live. Who is the real Messiah and who is the false Messiah? They choose the false Messiah. We do too. This is our daily struggle. To seek, to know, and to worship the true God instead of the God that I want. It is a daily battle to choose to live in submission and obedience to the true God instead of creating a counterfeit God that bows to me and my desires. This is a deeply troubling trend that is growing in our world. Many people who, in their pursuit of a God that they can control, have twisted and distorted Scripture to agree with their own desires and make God supportive of their causes. If we do this, all we will have succeeded in doing is creating a counterfeit God, a Jesus Barabbas, a God made in the image that we want him to be. This is idolatry. This is the sin from which all others flow. A rebellion against God in which we are unsatisfied as the creature and desire to be God for ourselves. Our sin is the sin of rejecting God and making Him the God that we want Him to be instead of worshiping the God that He is. And in rejecting the true God, like the Jews did, we also become prisoners, like Barabbas was. Prisoners of sin and death. Paul writes in Galatians 3, verse 22, the scripture declares that the whole world is a prisoner of sin. Mark wants us to see ourselves in this story. On the one hand, we are supposed to identify ourselves with the Jews who rejected the real Christ, opting for a counterfeit instead. And on the other hand, we're also supposed to identify ourselves as a prisoner, like Barabbas was, condemned to death because of our sin. We are the ones who deserve to die because we are the ones who have rejected the real Christ. And then comes something very interesting. Even though Jesus is innocent, he says nothing. And he willingly exchanges his life for Barabbas's, that Barabbas might live. Finishing the text from Mark 15, verse 12 to 15. And responding again, Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with him, who you call the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, Crucify him! But Pilate said to them, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Crucify him! Intent on satisfying the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas for them. And after having Jesus flogged, he handed him over to be crucified. The crowd, stirred up by the religious leaders, was intent on Jesus' death. And Pilate, who recognized Jesus' innocence, but cared more about pacifying the people, avoiding an uprising, gave in to the demands of the crowd. Crucify him, they begged. So they did. So Pilate released Barabbas and instead gave Barabbas' sentence of death 
to Jesus, and Jesus said nothing. Barabbas rightly deserved to be the one hanging on the cross. Barabbas should have been the one who was beaten, who was flogged, who was nailed hand and foot to the cross. It was his punishment to bear. It was his consequence to accept. And in an amazing exchange, Jesus willingly gives his life for the life of Barabbas. He accepts the penalty of death in order that Barabbas might walk free. The trial of Jesus symbolically teaches us something more. It gives us a profound illustration of what Jesus did for us. This is what theologians call the blessed exchange, where Jesus willingly takes on the sin and the brokenness of humanity, carrying it to the cross and dying the death that we deserved so that we might walk free, that we might have life and be reconciled. That is to be made right with God. He exchanges his life for ours. In Romans 5, verse 8 to 10, Paul writes, But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, or you could say even while we were still Barabbas, Christ died for us. The word for in that instance means on behalf of or in the place of. While we were still sinners, God died in our place. And then Paul continues in verse 9, Much more then, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, we were, for if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And then John writes in John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have ever uh, eternal life. This is the blessed exchange. That Christ died in our place. That we might be reconciled to God and have eternal life. This is why Friday is good. But it's not joyful. Because on this day we also acknowledge and we mourn that our sin has made his death necessary. Ponder that. I'll call up Pastor John Wheeler to lead us in communion. Robert led us in in the um, uh, thought provoking um, how things went on Good Friday with words. Uh, it's uh, it's another thing to celebrate communion and and you actually have something in your hands, something that you can feel and see. And, and also taste. And so, um, I think it's a good uh, it's a good way of, of illustrating a message that has just been preached. Uh, this Good Friday, uh, like on, on on Thursday or or be, before coming into Jerusalem, the, tight, the disciples have been quite excited a number of times. Uh, Jesus announced, "I'm going to build it. I'm going to build my church." And, and and the disciples were the first ones to hear that. I'm going to build my church, so they would be on the inside uh, of this place. And then, and then he announces, "But I'm going to die." And Peter says to him, "Quit talking like that. We want to we want to build a church." And Jesus says, "Get behind me, Satan." Uh, that that will have put Peter right down, and so. That, but then they go to Jerusalem, and he's as he rides in, a party erupts. 
uh, with, with, and we call that, that's what we call Palm Sunday, triumphal entry. That was last Sunday. And then they go about a, a day or two there, and then Jesus says, I'd like you to prepare the Passover for me. I want to eat the Passover with you, with his disciples. I think that must have been quite exciting again for the, because um, the Passover was designed, I believe, for the family. Each family would, would, would celebrate Passover. And here, Jesus is going to eat the Passover with his disciples. But Jesus had also said at one point, when, when his family came to him, they said, your, your mother and your brother's outside. And, and Jesus said, you know, my, my family, my mother and my, my brothers are those who believe. So now Jesus was saying, I'm, I want to eat the Passover with, with the ones who believe, my disciples. And I think they will have got... That will have been pretty exciting for them. And then, but before the meal begins, Jesus does something very interesting. He, he takes a towel and he starts washing the disciples' feet. Until he gets to Peter. Peter says, not me. You're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus responds, but you need it. Again, he must have uh, felt first he felt a little superior and then and then and then to be reprimanded like that you need it and then after the Passover meal Jesus institutes communion with the 11 disciples I believe that in there is when when Judas leaves and this time Peter does not protest he is learning hasn't learned but is learning to accept without protest or without criticism and that's I think that's an important concept to learn to learn to receive I know I'm not very good at that either to learn to receive something a gift and so that's what we want to do at communion we receive invited and receiving and so I welcome you to this table, um, mindful of the importance of it. It's, it's to remember what we just heard, so that we, we get a better sense of, of, of remembering what happened. It's the sermon that's acted out about a new covenant. The, in the old covenant, they were butchering lambs and sheep and, and goats and stuff like that. In the new covenant, it is the blood of Jesus, once for all. And he gave his body so that on our behalf, and, and, and that's something you have to accept. And we want to say, but you needn't have done that for me. But it's necessary We also want to remember that he arose. It's today we remember his death, but we he says when, when you celebrate this, also remember that that I rose, and it, my but it is through my broken broken body, and we also remember that he is coming back. This is what he 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 uh, said. What we should be uh, remembering. Um. So before we go to this remembrance meal, um, we want to also remember that we do not take it uh, without first having done a self-examination. And so for that reason, I think it is good that we take, uh, that, that we do a, a self-examination and, and, and each one takes, rather, it, it, it says Jesus gave and then they took so it, it's available but it doesn't mean that you have to take it if you're not ready for it so let's pray gracious father we thank you for for sending your son jesus to be our our savior our lord and we as we seek your face we are reminded of the cost of our redemption 
These were the deadly consequences of our sin. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, for being willing to become sin in our stead and being willing to die a sinner's death. And then we thank you for the new life that you give us as the victor over death. And so we want to remember through this remembrance meal and commit ourselves to new, to a following you, taking up our cross and walking by faith in the newness of resurrection life. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'd also like you to take a moment for yourselves and be quiet and then uh, and then uh, and then we will proceed with the meal. But speak to Jesus if because making things right is quick the, it, 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 but it's important. So let's speak to the Lord a little bit on each one with his on his own in his own mind. So, Lord, we thank you that you would hear and that you answer our prayers. In Jesus' name, amen. So the um, text tells us Jesus did eat, took bread, blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, take eat, this is my body. And so before we do that, before we distribute the bread, um, I want to... Uh, I guess what we could do is we could distribute it first and then uh, and then I will pray over it. So with that in mind, I think we will, uh, I guess we start from over here and here and we will uh, come in and take other, pick it up. We also have people who would distribute if you need it, then, then just raise your hand and somebody will bring it. And, and take both. Okay, might as well start from here. are wine and the inner circles are mixed or juice 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 okay
So before we partake of the bread, be reminded this is, this is different than sitting at a table at a restaurant or someplace and having a meal with someone else. This is, we are, this is a special time, a special place that Jesus instructed us to be mindful of. And so before we take of the bread, let's ask a blessing on it. We pray, gracious Father, that you will sanctify this bread. And so that as we partake of it, that it may be done in remembrance of you. We want to remember the body, your body, that was broken on our behalf. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so at this time, take and eat. And again, the cup was also distributed, and they all drank from it. And before we do, we want to pray a blessing on it. Our gracious God and Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you that for our redemption through the blood of Christ, we pray that you will sanctify, set apart this cup, and then bless all who partake of it by faith. Faith in the shed blood of Christ, that we may partake in true remembrance what you accomplished for us. In Christ's name, amen. And so at this time, let's partake, remembering that this is the blood of Christ. After this, Dave will come with a, a short Thanksgiving message. Not message, but a, 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 a psalm of Thanksgiving. Thank you, Don, Bob, um, and uh, so let's um, let's thank uh, Jesus. Um, and it's uh, the Psalm I've chosen is Psalm 34, and, and my Bible, it's it's actually appropriate title. It says taste, which is all we did, right? John, John said that we we're only tasting, but it says taste and see that the Lord is good, and that's what we're remembering. I will bless the Lord all at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the humble hear and be glad. O magnify the Lord with me, and let us his, exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look on him are radiant, or look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. The poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. And that's a great picture. Can you imagine? Uh, I'll, and I'll continue. I'm going to go to verse 19, but um, it's, it, you saw them in the westerns they'd circle the wagons God is circling the wagons around us with his angels oh taste and see that the Lord is good blessed is the man who takes refuge in him oh fear the Lord you his saints 
and those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer want and hunger, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, O children, listen to me. I will teach you and fear the Lord. Fear, the, teach you the fear of the Lord. What man is there who desires life and loves many days, but he may see good? Keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking deceit. Turn away from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. The eyes of the Lord are toward, toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil and cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of them all. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your son. And Jesus, thank you for giving your life willingly to us, for us, so that we don't have to pay the price, the payment that is due for our sin. And thank you that you send your angels to encamp around us. And when there's something to be feared, we don't have to be afraid because so we're surrounded by your angels. We thank you for this table and we thank you for causing us to remember the great price, but it was fully paid. And then you said on the cross, it is finished. There's nothing more for us to do but to accept it. Thank you. Help us to be quiet before you today. This is Stella Friedach. In my, thing, in, in my bad German, it's Quiet Friday. Help us to be quiet before you today. And remember this. In Jesus' name, amen. For closing, let us sing uh, another song, 102, Jesus, Wonderful Lord, 102, and if you are able, you can stand with me to sing.
Well, thank you for coming and worshiping with us. Uh, remember the meaning of Good Friday and make that make the resurrection on Sunday even more special. Go in peace. Have a good Friday. Thank you.